am very interested in not just my next guest, but in uh, the subject matter, in in the, I suppose, his field of expertise, his field of research. I've become increasingly interested in this, as you know, in the last couple of years. Um, before we introduce Michael, uh, he's written a series of books called The Joseph Communications. And those books are based on guidance, knowledge and information given to my guest by a spirit or an entity or energy that Michael knows as Joseph. I'm so glad that my great friend Maria Heller introduced me uh, to this work because I think it's very important now more than ever. Um, my guest is very interested in communicating with spirit, um, with uh, energies. Not just to prove that life after death is, is a reality, that life after death is real and is waiting for us, but also how you can interact and communicate with, uh, with a spirit or spirits to learn how to improve life in this reality. Delighted to be joined this afternoon, this evening, by Michael Rachia. Michael, you're very welcome to the programme. How are you? Thank you, Richie. I'm fine. How are you? I'm great. And you aren't you a magnanimous guy? Michael was supposed to be on the show last week, dear listener, but I messed up the booking. And uh, <laughs> Michael could have been a proper diva if he if he had wanted to be, but he he wasn't. He was a proper gentleman, and he said, "Don't worry about it. We'll do it this week." Uh, thank God you were. I've been digging into your background. You must have felt my presence. I've been digging in. I've been reading. I've been trying to uncover stuff. Not really. Oh my goodness. No, not really. I wanted to find out a little bit about you, and what I did find right. out was. This interest, not interest, your life's work went goes right back to when you were a child. Um, yes. Because you had an interesting, uh, you tell us the story, but when you were a kid you became interested in dying, death and what comes next. T tell us about that, Michael. Yes, I was, I was a strange child, Richie. Uh, when other kids were playing football and playing cricket and playing outside, I, I became uh, obsessed at times by the fact that I was going to die. Uh, now, that's not something that a five or six-year-old normally does, but I did. Uh, and I, I thought to myself, what's the point of me doing anything because I'm eventually going to die? And this, this black depression would come over me. And then I'd, I'd fight it off and I'd have a few months of uh, normality. Uh, and then it would come back. But that was tied in with um, extraordinary occurrences in my young life that I didn't understand. For example, I would have very specific dreams, sometimes about trivial things. For example, tomorrow morning you are going to have a parcel and a letter arrive, and that would happen. Or tomorrow morning your aunt and uncle that you haven't seen for years because they travel the world because he's in the Air Force will uh, turn up on your doorstep, and they did. Uh, sometimes I would wake up in the morning and see a figure sitting in my bedroom chair that would slowly fade away. Uh, I pick up atmospheres from places, uh, good and bad, and not understand that either, and not understand why sometimes I wanted to get out of, of, of somewhere at all costs, didn't want to be in a building that I hadn't been in before. Um, I was extremely sensitive and extremely shy. If you looked at me, I would blush, and, and didn't realize that this sensitivity was a sensitivity to alternate vibrations, if you like, to higher vibrations. Uh, and it wasn't until I was in my mid-twenties that it was explained to me that I wasn't mad, I was mediumistic. Uh, and that if I wished to, I could develop this gift to hopefully help others to better understand themselves and to live a more holistic life, realizing who and what they really are. No, no. This is fascinating. So, until your 20s, did you consider, did you think to yourself, there must be something wrong with me? And did you Absolutely. look into that? You did. You, so you did. Yeah, I thought I was completely mad. And I think my parents, who were very loving and very kind towards me, uh, didn't know what to do with their wayward son. Right. Uh, the, the, the son that reacted so strangely and so differently to other children. Uh, so, yes, I thought there was something wrong. But as, as time went on, I, I, I began to realize that I was psychic. Uh, I researched a little bit and thought, well, I'm psychic. But I didn't know what to do with it, and I certainly didn't know how to control it. And my life until my early 20s was at the mercy of chaos, shall we say. Right. But then as soon as I connected to my mission, if you like, in life, 
things began to make sense and I was put in the driving seat of my life for the first time. And I took control of my life for the first time. And I made progress for the first time. All because I was uh, suddenly who I was supposed to be and understood what was happening to me. I can imagine there was a great peace came over you when that, when that happened. Yes, it, it, was, it was a long uh, process. Uh, it, it first happened to me via an aunt in Blackpool, uh, near the seaside, of course, the seaside, of course. And uh, I went there during a traumatic event in my life because I needed somewhere to go. My nerves were bad. And on the Saturday night, my aunt and uncle, who I knew uh, were spiritualists, said, do you want to come with us to the spiritualist church? Now, at that time, I was a staunch Catholic. Uh, and I thought, no, this is evil. This is the devil's work. I can't go. Right. But my nerves were in such a state that I couldn't stay at home alone in the house. And so I found myself uh, being shepherded, my aunt on one side, my uncle on the other, into a very pleasant room uh, that was filled with old ladies who were uh, offering cups of tea and cakes. And then a, a lady medium took the platform, took to the platform. And I thought, well, ev either she's been through everyone's wallets and handbags prior to, to getting onto that platform, <laughs> or something's happening yeah. here that I don't understand. And she began to uh, talk to members of the congregation, audience, and she came to me. And she said, within five years, you'll be doing what I'm doing. Did and she know? said, you'll be a medium that other mediums will look up to. And I was shocked, but there was something within me that knew that what she was saying was correct. And that started me off on the path. That's what started you off. You're listening to Michael Rachia. We're going to be talking about the Joseph Communications. The website is thejosephcommunications.co.uk. Michael has been explaining, fascinating this, on, on, on what happened to him when he was a child, his interest in death, those experiences he had, seeing energies in, in his bedroom, figures in chairs, knowing things or being told that things would happen. Um, and then they, they, they happened, feeling there was something wrong with him for many years, only to discover that, of course, there wasn't anything wrong with him, that he had a talent or, or, or a gift, um, uh, if you want to put it like, like that. And when, so this, this lady says, right, Michael, it's going to be you then. Um, you're, yeah. you're, you're going to, to, to make this journey. You're going to take these steps. Did you become more sensitive? I've always, I've never asked this of anybody like yourself. Did, did, as you got older, did you become more sensitive to energies and to things I happening? Be, uh, well, uh, I began to join the dots from that point right. onwards. And the next stage was to uh, contact, I didn't know it was going to happen, was to contact my spiritual teacher. So having been told that I was mediumistic, I began to visit various uh, spiritualist churches because that was the only place where you could see mediums operate, and to make my own mind up as to whether some mediums were good, some mediums were not so good, whether this church was for me, this yeah. church was not for me. And uh, I, I visited a, a church in Great Harwood in Lancashire, and a very stern-looking gentleman, as I was sitting in the audience, came up to me and said, uh, would you like to be in my circle? And uh, I very timorously said, well, I'm not sure what to expect. And he said, well, me. <laughs> <laughs> every, every Wednesday, come and, come and sit. It's an open circle. Come and sit, and you can help develop. <laughs> and so I, I went to this circle on a number of Wednesdays, and, and Bruce, were it, for it was he, uh, an ex-naval man, and a very straightforward medium who, had he not got anything to say to anyone, would say, I've nothing tonight, so that's it, folks, we're going home. He was, he was superbly honest. During one of his sessions, or, or after one of his sessions, I looked across, and various different people would come on different nights. And there was a lady sitting opposite me, and I thought, I know you, you're a nurse. And I'd never seen this lady physically before in my life. And over a cup of tea, we got to talking, uh, and uh, it, it, she invited me to her home to meet her husband. And she said, look, you've got a gift. She said, if you want to develop this gift to help others, then I will sit with you. Uh, but you, once, you have to understand that once you place your feet on this path, you can't take them off again. It's a lifetime commitment. It's a sacrifice. It's a life of sacrifice. Now, do you want to do it? But the other thing was, I discovered, as she told me about her life, 
that she had been a nurse during the Second World War. And there was this instant reconnection with somebody that I'd known beyond this life. And I sat with Joan for seven years. I was working for an advertising agency at the time. So every Sunday afternoon, I would go and sit in her front room. And she taught me how to meditate. She taught me how to tune in. And the amazing thing was that when I started to see uh, higher vibrations, when I started to communicate with discarnate spirits, it was arranged so that I could begin a message, I could begin a narrative, hand over to Joan, she would see the same thing, hand back over to me, and I would round off the message. We saw the same people. We heard the same voices. And you can imagine how that boosted my confidence in what I could do. That, and and it, it, it rubber-stamped the fact that you weren't unwell. I mean, that's very important. I mean, because that yeah. stuff lingers, doesn't it? I mean, you'd made your peace with all that, but it still lingers. I mean, you still have the occasional thought, well, what's really going on here? Because it, I don't know very much about this. I'm very open to it. I, I, used, yeah. I used not to be open to it. I was never rude, but I had no interest in it. I didn't believe it. Um, I'm wide open now to learning about it and listening uh, to people like yourself, because I believe you to be sincere. You, you know, I know some energy healers and I've met, I've met one or two mediums, but but yeah. I'm not being negative now. I don't think I am, but I've got to address this elephant because my Absolutely. listeners will kill me if I don't. Um, what you do and, and people like you, I, I think you do, you, you, you've got the ability to do special things and you do. But what you do, I think, is also blighted by charlatans, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, this is a big issue. Uh, cold readers that, um, that do this. And, as in, yeah. Yeah. As in, as in religion, and I'm not a religious person, I like to yeah. think of myself as a spiritual person, but I'm not a religious person. And in religion, you have, you know, you have good ministers, you have not so good ministers. And it is open to uh, misinterpretation. Uh, but I, I built up evidence for myself in that when I was ready, John said, well, why don't you take a church service and why don't you sit with people now i didn't charge them anything richie yeah. and i must emphasize that with the joseph communications books yes the books cost money but the money from the books goes back into reprinting the books and advertising the books and making people more aware of the communications message. We do not take anything personally. I was going Never to mention have. that. I was going to mention it several times because it's important. That's an important yeah. thing. It's not about money. And so, thanks yes. for mentioning it. But I was going, due diligence. I was going to say it anyway. That the oh, books you. th that you're not making money out of the books or your team. And we're going to come to the books in a moment. It's uh, 19 minutes past six. Michael Rachia is our guest. Um, to, to say there's big interest in this is an understatement. Go to the website, richieallen.co.uk. Lots of comments coming in, emails as well. Questions, nice comments from Michael. We'll get to, uh, to, uh, to some of those. How amazing. You and Joan hearing and feeling the same things. And you mentioned, you know, you, you, it, it came to you. It was communicated to you that Joan was a nurse. Um, she'd worked as a nurse in the Second World War. But you also hinted at you believe that in other lifetimes you and Joan knew one another. Yes. I mean, I, I only have a handful of experiences that I've accessed to consciously from past lives. But the, the most amazing thing is that we, we have incarnated together at least three times. Now, I remember being in Egypt with her as a woman. And I remember having uh, my left arm wouldn't work. Now, until I was in my early 20s, I had problems with my left arm in this life. And we were seers in that life. But we were seers in a temple. We were seers uh, on behalf of authority. I don't know what that authority was. But I remember being in this gloom in this temple and seeing channels in the floor that carried water which didn't make any sense to me. There were stone troughs on the floor that carried water. Now, years later, after this experience, I saw a documentary on Egypt, and a, a chap was talking about, an archaeologist was talking about a temple, and said that, well, they had channels in the temple that carried water to certain points. 
Now, that was astounding enough, but the, 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 the most vivid recollection I have of the life with Joan is when we were both in Germany. And the thing that made this true for me is that as I related part of what I could remember, again, she followed on with what she could remember. And we could remember details down to the actual furnishings and uh, uh, curtains that we had in this house. And we lived in a, a splendid house. I did uh, far better for myself in that particular <laughs> life than I, than I have in this life, Richie. But Michael, how and do you cope with that? I mean, how do you deal with such uh, a realisation that you're present in the present with a lady and yep. you know because you share experiences that, you know, that this has happened? Germany, I mean, how do you cope with that? I mean, is that a joyous thing? Is it a wonderment thing? Or is it a bit spooky, you know, on one level? I wouldn't I wouldn't call it spooky. I think it's a natural development of where our journey was, was taking us. And uh, also part of a realization that we often reincarnate with members of a soul family. Right. In other words, we, we reincarnate with people that we've been with before in order to work out certain experiences and to learn in certain ways and to evolve in certain ways. So it, it didn't spook me. I think what, what uh, spooked me was the level of detail in this particular memory in that I remember that we both came out of the house uh, on a particular day and we had three children. And uh, we, there was a horse. We had a, a horse and uh, carriage, horses and carriage, actually. We got into this carriage and we set off and we were in a high location going down the side of a mountain with trees on one side and a, a drop and on the other side uh, rocks. Uh, and there was a storm, a sudden storm. And there was a lightning flash and it spooked the horses and they reared up and the us and the cart and the horses tumbled down this ravine and ended up in the woodland at the bottom. And I remember to this day getting up and Joan getting up behind me and the three children getting up behind us. And I looked at her and I said, oh, we're dead. <laughs> and then there was a bright light and that's all I remember. And that's all you remember. And then, that, but, sorry, go ahead, Michael. Yes, of that particular incident. Yes. Yeah. And then it's on to a new incarnation. Is that what you believe? And we're going to talk about the Joseph Communications right now and how you came to, to meet Joseph and who Joseph is. Um, I can't wait for you to talk about that. But um, is, is that how, I mean, are we all having these experiences, all of us? And is there some barrier preventing us from understanding that? Because I haven't had the experiences you've had. I'd love to. I'm wide open to, to, the, to the possibility that I've had several incarnations, you know, different times, different time periods, different times in history. But I have no feeling of that. I'd love to. I'd love to. Know. Yeah. Are we all experiencing this? Do you think? We are experiencing, but there's a greater tale with reincarnation, and that moves on to the connection with Joseph. Because as I uh, began working as a medium, it quickly became apparent that the same personalities, the same people, were very often turning up at the same church services year in, year out. And so I used to serve over 50 churches across the country, and I would do two services per church per year. And very often I would go to the same churches and the same people would be there. And you would talk to them about spirituality and you would talk to them about the, the meaning of their life and who they really were and why they were here. Uh, but you would see them sit up and pay attention the minute that you started uh, a clairvoyant session. That's what they wanted. They wanted the messages. And that always upset me because, yes, it's fine uh, for one person if, for example, you tell them that their grandfather knows they haven't painted the garden fence yet. <laughs> but that's, that's a message and a trivia for one person. And I thought there must be more to this. If communication is coming to me, where is it coming from? Yes. Why does it happen? What's the purpose behind it? And that was always my quest to, to answer those questions for myself and then hopefully on behalf of uh, others. And I became so tired uh, because in my particular case, it takes a lot of energy to do what I do. I became so tired at two points during my mediumship that I actually stopped. 
I thought, this is pointless. I mean, I had people coming to my home. I had people, I was booked up two to three months in advance. Uh, I would have people ringing me at all times of day and night saying, well, you told me this and now I'm standing. For example, someone once, I, I was once given three uh, letters, three digits from a registration number uh, for a new car for someone. Someone was saying, look, you're about to buy a new car. Here are three digits from the registration number. Later that day, the lady rang me up. She'd already had three quarters of an hour a session with me. And uh, she said, I'm standing in a garage. There are two cars here. They both have the same three digits. Which one should I choose? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, this is not yeah. what it's about. It's not about that, yeah. yeah. It's not about that. And so uh, the, the path to, to Joseph came about because I thought that I knew everything about Joan and she knew everything about me. She was like a second mother. Her husband was like a second father to me. And then one day a great sadness came across her and she said that she had um, gone into trance. I'd never realized that she'd been a trans medium and that her best friend at the time had written down by hand these amazing messages that had come through about life, the universe, and everything. And uh, her friend had unexpectedly died. And at her funeral, she'd asked her friend's daughter if she could have that handwritten book of notes. And the daughter, who was part of a particular uh, clique religion, said, no, this is the work of the devil. A devil. I've thrown it on the back of the fire. And Joan was uh, at a loss and had been for many years because she felt that that information had been lost. Now, by that point, I'd been working professionally as a medium for a number of years. And I thought, hang on a minute. I don't think it is lost. I think I can connect with the communicator and I think I can bring it through again. Uh, and so uh, a, a friend of mine, a, a member of what Joseph describes as the band of light, there are four of us. There's myself, my life partner, Jane, uh, David, and Tony. And David had wanted to be part of a spiritual project for a long, long time. And so I said, look, we have an opportunity, I think, to connect with whoever Joan was talking to and to bring through this higher vibrational information on behalf of humanity. Shall we try? We were both working at the time, so when we could, and sometimes it was only once every two or three months, uh, we would go up into his attic, <laughs> turn the lights off, put a cassette in the recorder, and I would attempt to tune in. And on the first occasion, there was a lot of grunting from me because I wasn't used to working with this person. Uh, but at the end of the session, I was absolutely exhausted, but we, we had a chapter. Every time Joseph came through, he delivered a complete chapter for one of his books. Word perfect, apart from the initial grunting, which was my fault. Which is you. And we looked at each other and thought, this has got to get out somehow. This is, is of great importance to humanity. Uh, and so I then got together with my life partner, and there were three of us, and there was more power available, and we sat regularly. And pretty soon we had the first book, Revelation. And we thought, well, we've got a book, but we're a, a little fish in a, a very big pond. How are we going to get this book out? And we were told from the personalities on the other side, as it were, look, don't you worry about that. Get it published. Leave the distribution to us. And so in faith, we, we published the first book. And then we sat there with a pile of books. And in the first two weeks, we sold two books. <laughs> right. And we thought, what on earth have What's we done? What's going on, yeah. But then uh, we, we connected with Tony, who has a fabulous place in Lancashire called the Sanctuary of Healing. And he said, why don't you, uh, he got hold of one of our books. Somebody gave him one of our books. And he kept nudging his wife. He read it all one night and kept nudging his wife and saying, Sheila, this is amazing. And what's even more amazing is that these people are just down the road. And so he invited us in. And we decided between us that we would give credence to what was happening by taking Joseph on the road, as it were, and by holding public trans demonstrations at which people could ask questions of Joseph. Because for all people knew, we could have been making all this stuff up in a little room somewhere and typing it out and churning it out and publishing it. So we, we held a number of public trans demonstrations. And Joseph, I would stand up. Now, my legs were locked in, into position from the moment that I stood up to the moment I sat down. I'd close my eyes. I'd take one breath as Michael, the next breath as Joseph.
live, and he would talk for an hour and a half to an hour and three quarters. Michael, hang on. A friend now. of mine hang on. invited. Michael, to, hang on, hang on. Sorry. This is mind blowing to me. What yeah. does that feel like? That it, first of all, it's mind. I've never spoken to anybody who's had this experience. That that the books have come through. Joseph, through Joseph, who is no longer with us, he's an energy, he's a spirit. And so many things to ask you about that. There's going to have to be a part two of this conversation, of course, with your permission, because this is Absolutely. amazing. But Michael, please describe the physicality. When you are in trance and Joseph is using Michael to communicate, where do you go? What happens? It's, it's very weird and very difficult to describe. Uh, I used to think when, it, when all this began that I, I, I would, as it were, feel these words coming out of my mouth. I would think, at any time, Michael, you can intercept this and you can stop it. And on several occasions, I attempted to do so and then realized that I couldn't. I could not regain control of my voice box and my movements. And it feels sort of like being in a dream. At times, I would be standing behind myself, uh, looking over my own shoulder. But the first time, I, I was very wary of being taken into trance. I was invited to do trance work, and I thought, I don't like the sound of this. I'm going to lose consciousness, and I don't like losing consciousness. Yeah, who does, yeah. And the first time I was taken into trance was not by Joseph, but by one of the other personalities from the soul group that Joseph is a part of. And we were driving back from a holiday. Fortunately, uh, Jane was driving, and I was suddenly taken over, and I found myself not sitting in a car, but standing in a beautiful cathedral, looking up at this wonderful vaulted ceiling. And uh, I, I looked ahead, uh, and at the same time as this was happening to me, someone was talking through me to Jane, and I looked ahead in this cathedral, and there was a statue of an angel, a tall statue of an angel on a plinth. But as I looked at it, it was moving. It was alive, and I was fascinated. And behind the angel, uh, to the left and to the right, were two doors. And I knew that if I went through the door on the left... I'd go. I would die. I'd be gone. But there was a feeling of bliss and a, a magnetism towards this door. I thought, well, if this is dying, there's nothing to it. It's like falling off a log. Here we go. And so I, I, I wandered over towards this left door. And at the moment that I reached it, in the car, the person who was speaking to Jane said, just a minute, Michael's going somewhere he shouldn't go. And in my vision, he suddenly turned up in front of me and said with a, a raised eyebrow, where do you think you're going? And I said, well, I'm going through that door. And he said, no, you're not. Turn round. It's not your time to go through there yet. And so I turned round, and then he completed his um, address to Jane. And then I was taken out of trance, and I found myself back in the car, very woozy, and then was instantly taken into trance again by another member of, the, of Joseph Soul Group. And this time I found myself on a grassy bank, uh, beautiful, beautiful flowers, this grassy bank, and I was looking across a valley towards very beautiful buildings. There was a purple building in the distance, and it was turning slowly in the overall sunlight, is the only way I can describe it. And as it turned, I could see that the parts of it weren't connected, and yet it was a, a whole building. It was just rotating slowly in the sun. Something in and the future, sat, maybe. Something in the future. Were, were you some place that has yet to, to materialise, maybe? Something I, futuristic. I think I, was, I think I was in one of the spiritual realities. Right. I don't think it was Earth at all. I think it was a higher vibration, uh, having, having seen those realities yeah. on a number of occasions since. And did you feel, do you feel bliss when you're in that situation? Like when you're in... Yes, the, you do. Right, it's a blissful you, experience, right? You, you feel a blissful experience and you feel a peace. Uh, and whenever there's a communication with the, the, the members of the soul group, this peace descends. And there is a, a permanence to life that you don't get with your normal, with your ordinary five senses. There's a feeling that we are immortal. We are eternal. We are infinite. It's just that we've forgotten these things and shoehorned ourselves into this physical existence and believe that this physical existence is, is all there is. Yeah, yeah. well, I've lived, but well, I did live most of my life with that 
in mind that what you can see and feel and taste and smell and touch, that's about all there is. And I would have been, yeah. as I said, very reluctant to even consider other possibilities. But then I've had experiences which have made me think long and hard and, and think again. Let me just mention a couple of things now. I'll ask Michael to come back and talk about Joseph's messages in the books in uh, in, in in the near future, say in a couple of weeks, if Michael will come back and do that with his permission. Because we are going to run out of time today. We've got probably 15 minutes left. I'd like to stay with trance. I've got a couple of questions that you might find a bit childish, but I'll ask them anyway. You're, okay. you, I, I, there's no such thing as a bad question. At least that's uh, that's what I think. Michael Rachia is our guest. Folks, do go and check out the josephcommunications.co.uk. So glad that Maria made the connection because I've not heard um, you know, a story or an experience like this before to be given a series of messages, um, detailed messages and guidance from from Joseph, a spirit, and for the group to be able to, um, to, to, to take all that down while Joseph is communicating through Michael. This is really, really interesting stuff. Let me just mention a couple of quick comments there before I ask you what I wanted to ask you. Um, yeah. Patricia says you're a beautiful person I've read every single one of Michael's books and they are truly life changing I highly recommend all of them uh, Isabel says Michael mentioned Richie something very interesting about his left arm that he had issues with it in this life and in a previous life would you ask Michael if he believes that medical issues like asthma and phobias are in fact related to previous lives now I love this concept that in a previous life Michael uh, you know, God forbid, but in a previous life or spirit forbid that I drowned yeah. maybe. Maybe I drowned. Maybe I was uh, in, in the Navy and then maybe I, I have a fear of water in this life. Now, I don't, but but just that possibility, you know. Is she right? Uh, it's, it's, it's very strange that you should mention that, Richie, because that exact phobia came up many years ago in a, a reading that I was holding for a, a, a young lady. And uh, the spirit who was communicating with her said, she is frightened of water. So I said, are you frightened of water? They're telling me that you are. And she said, yes, I'm terrified. And he said, she was in a submarine. She was in a submarine in a previous life, and the submarine went down. And she was trapped, and she couldn't get out. And will you explain that to her? Because that knowledge, hopefully, will take away that phobia in, in this life. Now, we've all got phobias. I've, I've got so many, I, ca I can't mention them all, Richie. And I think that's to do with my sensitivity, you know, to, to other vibrations. Uh, but on occasion, yes, uh, the, the severe things that happen to us are echoes of the past. Uh, because as Joseph says, when we, when we come back into this world, the, if you like karma, now that's a vast subject, but the, the traits that we have put into the uh, atmosphere via our previous lives are still there. We haven't cleared them away. And they have a magnetic quality to them, as does our particular vibration. Our individual vibration, there's no other vibration quite like it. And our vibration attracts similar vibrations. So when we come back here, clustering around us are the vestiges of things that have happened to us in the past that have not been resolved or put to rest, as it were. And so it's a bit of a dangerous passage coming here, which is something we can perhaps uh, comment on the next time around. But we do attract tendencies from our own past and unsolved situations from our own past uh, and unsolved, um, what can I say, uh, trends from our own past the minute that we reincarnate here. So, and as we grow older and our energies grow less vital on this level, then those tendencies, uh, it's easier for those tendencies to cluster around us and to have an effect on us. But we can do something about it. We can negate them, but we have to understand that they're there. Now, that's fascinating. I did a TV gig years ago and I was introduced to um, a medium who I found to be very sincere um, I have to say, looking into your background today and digging up all that dirt that I didn't manage to find. <laughs> and of course, I wasn't doing that. I was um, just looking, you know, for some background we could talk about and stuff. But, yes, um, I, I, you know, and, and I trusted him. And he knew nothing about me. And, and I, I had never spoken about this to anybody. And he said to me, um, 
you are a strange one, you, he said, Richie, being a very tall guy. You have a real serious fear of heights, don't you, he said to me. And he said, um, you were on holiday somewhere, he said, I think it might have been Germany. And you had a bad experience. And I did, um, I went to, to Munich and I went to that big communications tower in Munich, which is a tourist attraction. And I hate heights and I got to the top of it and had a bit of a panic attack and very embarrassing when you're a big, ugly, baldy, tall guy like me. But, uh, but he knew that. And he said, I can't quite figure it out. He said, I don't have the actual information. I'm not getting it, he said. But wouldn't be surprised, he said, Richie, if, um, you know, in, in a previous incarnation that maybe there was something, maybe you fell from a great height, maybe, or maybe you're in a, you know, a plane crash or, or, or God knows what. And I thought, wow. And that's, you, you know, it was, it was very um, revealing that. It was very interesting to me. And again, of course, being a sceptic, I, I, I tried to figure out how and who told him. And, but of course, nobody told him. He, he intuitively knew that. Michael Rachie is our guest. So let me read some nice comments from people. And then I'll ask you about spirit and... Um, you know, this uh, trance, because I was going to ask you, is permission sought from um, the physical person? Because that's an interesting one. I'll ask you about that in a moment. Keely says, fascinating, Richie, uh, is Michael. I have a friend who channeled a, a book via her spirit guide. That's very interesting. It's called The Spirit of Life in Ibiza. Most of it is, in, most of it is written in rhyme relating to current events. Uh, she wrote the book five years ago. Kay says, I'm loving the chat with Michael. I thought I was imagining uh, seeing figures until I started describing to my neighbour. I described to my neighbour a woman that floated through my lounge one day and disappeared into the wall. Before I could finish the description, my neighbour finished off uh, the conversation by saying, I'm delighted because uh, I've seen the same woman and I haven't seen her for a few years. How amazing. What, a, what an experience that is. And uh, Cookie says, I heard that how you die goes with you. So what is happening now to our elderly uh, in such pain, they might take it with them. And just to finish off the comments, a very good friend of the programmes, um, energy healer called Peter Ebden, former war snooker champion, gentleman and a scholar. He says, uh, fascinated listening to Michael, says uh, Peter. Uh, he might, um, if he hasn't already, take a look at the books of the late Tony Neat from the College of Healing, uh, who channeled a higher energy called H-A. That's fascinating stuff. Um, huge interest in you being on the programme tonight and uh, and people are loving it. We, you are listening to Michael Rachia. If you haven't done it before, get to the josephcommunications.co.uk. Look at the series of books. Michael and the team don't get a bob from the sales of the books. The money goes back into restocking and advertising uh, the books. So th this, this is great stuff. So spirit or um, the energy who wants to communicate through you, you've given me the impression you're in the car with Jane, doesn't ask your permission, Michael. I, I genuinely mean that that would concern me because that to me says that you could be open to that happening with an energy that isn't as benevolent. Well, permission was asked oh, was it? Okay. at an earlier stage. And at every stage in my development, uh, they have been respectful enough to, to ask permission. And I, I'd, I'd also have to say that motive um, results in the vibrations that you attract towards yourself. So my motive is always to connect with the highest source that I possibly can. And I always begin a, a session when I'm consciously, when I know that I'm going to begin a session by saying, uh, you know, the, the G word, the God word, is a, is a dirty word at the moment, isn't it? People have abandoned the G word. Yeah. Now, you can call God source, you can call God creative energy, but I have absolute belief in that higher power. And so I align myself with that higher power before I allow any spiritual contact to be made, knowing that in doing so, I'm protecting myself and that the information that comes through is from the highest possible vibration, the highest possible source. And likewise, I close myself down afterwards so that I can operate, hopefully, for what passes for normal with me on this level uh, following a, a session. Uh, so, yes, permission was asked at every uh, single stage, including when I uh, began to work clairvoyantly. So I was expecting it. And the reason that I was taken 
into trance in the car was because, as I mentioned earlier, I was terrified of going into trance. Uh, from being a child, when I had my tonsils out when I was five, and I wasn't prepared for being put on the operating table and somebody putting a sucker on my face, yeah. and I struggled. I can still remember the, the uh, doctor shouting, stop struggling, child. And since that time, I've had a phobia, which is lessened now, of losing consciousness. And so the prospect of handing over my consciousness to someone else and me, as I thought, going into oblivion for a while was not a pretty one, was no. not a, a happy one for me. I can and so they took me into trance unexpectedly, having asked permission that I would do the trance work to show me that I wouldn't, in fact, lose consciousness. It would just be a, a state of altered consciousness. Uh, and then I would be brought back safely into my body and mind. You're listening to Michael Rachie, and you're as fascinated as I am by this. And of course, some of my listeners are bored by some of my questions because some of my listeners are much further along the road in their own understanding than I am. But we have a great saying in Ireland. It's called tough shit, Paddy. And um, <laughs> sorry for swearing, but that's the way it is. It's, it's, it's my football and I, I decide who plays. But no, it is, it is, it is new uh, to me. And I'm sure you've heard these questions a million times before. The Joseph Communications.co.uk. Here's a the question I've been dying to ask you. Um, I believe something very wrong is happening in, in the world. I believe that there are, are people who want to take humanity in to a place that's very, very dark, very ugly. Um, it's enslavement. We, we, we can call it so many different things. And, and I wonder, in the last two years, is because I, 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 I'm just an ordinary bloke and I feel the weight of it sometimes. You might talk about the weight now. You might talk about energy and the weight and the atmosphere. I feel the weight of it and I get a bit upset and, but then I get over it. You know, I go out and I do something. I imagine somebody like you, somebody as sensitive as you are, and that's just based on what, you know, what you experienced as a child. That's obviously not left you. You're still incredibly sensitive. I imagine it's even tougher for you these types of it times. I, I knew something was coming, and I knew something evil was coming for two years before all this started. Uh, I began not to sleep. Uh, I would be lucky if I got three hours sleep a night. And I knew that the vibrations were changing because whatever happens in the world happens first as a spiritual act. Now, by spiritual, I don't mean good or bad. I mean that because we are spirit beings... We first create spiritually, and then we filter down those concepts into what we call reality here. And I knew that something was coming. And I agree with you entirely that this is a time when the light, the light energy that we have within us, and maybe we can talk about that next time as well, uh, needs to be streamed into the world to counter the darkness that has descended into the world at the moment. And the reason it's descended, briefly, is because we have rejected what we really are. We're wandering, wandering around as, as beings with no memory. We're not flesh and blood. The flesh and blood is simply a vehicle. We are spiritual beings. We are creative beings. And if you shut that out, if you uh, deny that, and instead worship materialism, worship control, uh, worship supposed earthly power, uh, worship supposed earthly riches, and they take the place of what you really are, you're left with the chaos that we see around us at the moment. And what is your instinct? What is your feeling um, about the chances of turning it around? I mean, you said what needs to happen. I heard you loud and clear and some yeah. good friends of the program have been on and, and, and said as much as, as you've said. So that, 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 that's fine. You know what needs to happen. How yeah. confident are you that there's enough of us left? I don't mean us as in there's enough of me and you left, but there's enough people left who can connect to what we really are in order to turn this around. Well, we are, we are working to, to do our bit to, to do that. Um, if you've researched me, you, you will come across the World Meditation Alliance that yeah. we put together, where uh, once a week, uh, well, twice a week now in the UK and once a week in the US, as many people as we can gather together uh, sit with a very specific intention to act as conduits for the light energy that can change things here. 
Uh, there was an experiment in the 60s. Uh, they call it the Maharishi effect. And I should know which city it was, and I, I don't. I think it was New York, but I'm not sure. And 7,000 people meditated for a month and directed their thoughts to that city. During that month, the crime rate went down. The, uh, the number of accidents went down. People were healed inexplicably in hospitals without medical intervention. And what we intend to do is to link as many people worldwide as we can to get that light in. The, 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 the problems that we have began spiritually. The solution has to begin spiritually. We cannot tackle it solely on a physical level. It won't work. We have to tackle it at source. And what is wrong is at source, is at, uh, is at heart of so many souls at the moment. And they have become obsessed, bewildered, entranced by supposed power, by supposed control. Uh, and all these things are illusion, but they don't think so. And you have to wonder if a soul is uh, putting all their energies into controlling others, all their energies into amassing power and money, how long do they think they're going to be here? You know, yeah. it, it, it would be a very uh, enlightened soul that could buy their way out of eventual physical death. You know, you, you have to wonder what's going on in their minds. But there again, there's a clue, because it's going on in their head minds. We have two minds. As spirit beings, we have the head mind, which is the lizard mind, which is the calculating mind, which is the fight or flight survival mind. And we have the heart mind. And the heart mind is the connection to the source energy that we are a part of. Uh, and one of the things we teach is to, to reconnect to the heart mind, to move consciousness from the head down to the heart and to receive spiritual information from the heart that makes the path forwards clear and true and honest and kind and loving. That's a great place to leave it for today. Um, the josephcommunications.co.uk, the, the website is lovely, by the way. Go and check it out. You'll see the series of books there given to Michael and Michael's uh, team, his group, by the spirit Joseph. Next time we, we can talk about the messages contained within the books for sure and certainly um, about the light work that you talked about earlier on. You've been listening to Michael Rachia. Yeah? Michael, it's been a real pleasure. Um, it's been a real gift, I think, and a real tonic to be, you know, to, to hear you. Uh, you. You know, when often a news show like this is often bogged down by talking about things that are, that are, are not nice. And this has been nice. It's been enlightening and very interesting. And I, I hope in a couple of weeks' time, even early, even very early June, if it suits you, holidays uh, permitting, that you come back and we, we maybe do 90 minutes and we talk a bit more. But I've really loved having you on. I, I would love to do that, Richard. Can I just very quickly, it'll only take a second. Go right if, ahead. If people, if people want to see current soul messages from the group through me they can find them on the Joseph Communications on YouTube the, Oh I should have said that, the channel of course thank you, I should have said that Yes, the Joseph, <laughs> the Joseph Communications on YouTube I've been watching the videos myself uh, today in preparation for our chat, uh, check that out on YouTube as well, Michael, thank you and um, if, if not later tonight, first thing in the morning I'll um, send you an email and we'll, we'll, make, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make a date as it were for our next conversation um, thanks for your time, I really appreciate it Thank you so much for having me, Richie. You take care of yourself. Bye, Michael. Michael Rachia, folks, the josephcommunications.co.uk. Big shout out to Maria Heller for connecting Michael with the programme. Maria was saying, got to get him on, Richie. And uh, Michael's a very humble guy because I, I just wouldn't know because this is all new to me. I'm like, who? Who's that chap? And then I, I began to read about the books and I see that there's a huge following and the YouTube channel, lots and lots of interest. Lovely. And I look forward to picking that up again in the future with Michael and those topics with people like Mark and Peter and others. It's important, I think, we, uh, we talk about those uh, these things going forward. There's a cliche for you. Going forward, moving forward. That's corporate speak, that crap, isn't it? Who needs that on a Tuesday? Thanks for all the messages, by the way, that came through. Nelly says, uh, great stuff for Michael, brilliant stuff. Eckhart Tolle uh, talks about this in his book, The Power of Now. I have to say, um, the oft-mentioned future Mrs. Uh, El Frago herself is uh, an, an ardent collector of books like that, Nelly. 
and uh, it's to to not not to my annoyance. I'm not. I'm never annoyed. Not. I'm not like. But it's every other day. There's a book coming through the letterbox. You know, from secondhand bookshops and all sorts. Yes, she's uh, gathering quite the collection of books on these subjects. Um, Ephesians six twelve says Colin. Thank you, Colin. Absolutely. Uh, Paul is not convinced. Paul says this is all part of the new age religion, says Paul. This will be the new world order's religion. That's Paul's take on it. Thank you, Paul. I'll read them all out. Uh, Tracy says don't leave it too long to have him back on. We'll get him back on early June, Tracy, if not before then. Uh, sounds like he's up for it. I'm certainly very interested in having him back. That's it for me. Thanks, Jackie. And uh, thanks again to Michael Rachia. Lovely to uh, listen to Michael the last hour. The website is thejosephcommunications.co.uk.